Oh, okay. So I guess uh, I need to recap here a little bit. So to recap, we live in a new media ecology, okay, where these three things and context are very important and they lead to wicked problems. We know that standard approaches don't work, that there is no royal road to teaching, that creativity is the only solution, and we now know that creativity needs to be, a creative solution is novel, effective, and whole, and we get there not through magic, but through a playful process of tweaking knobs. All right? So the big question then becomes, what are teachers and teacher educators to do? Where do the knobs come from? Which brings us back to the refrain. Teaching with technology is a wicked problem, and that's because CPT and overlaps and context are, lead to a wicked problem. Teachers, uh, wicked problems require creative solutions. We know what creative solutions are novel, effective, and whole, and it's not magic. It's a process that we can go through, and the teachers are designers of the total package. All right. Number three, teachers are designers of the total package. So what do we mean when we say total package? <clears throat> the first thing is that we have these three, technology, pedagogy, and content. They are critical for any kind of teaching endeavor to take place, that they work within specific contexts. We have talked about overlaps taking them two at a time. And I want to take us now to the most important overlap, which is all three taken together. It's at the center of these three that what we call CPCK, technological pedagogical content knowledge, exists. And yes, it is a mouthful. So as Glenn suggested, we try to buy a vowel, you know, 50 bucks, and there we have it. And the interesting thing here is that TPAC also becomes an acronym for total package. TPAC, total package. Oh. All right, so I'm sure you get it. <clears throat> now, this is not to say that this is something new that we are saying. Many people have said this, and in fact, good teachers understand this instinctively. So the question then becomes, how does TPAC help? And it seems to us that what TPAC does is that technology opens us new possibilities for us. I want to give some examples quickly here. The first one is one that I already mentioned before, the one with Moodle and the I agree problem. That's a good solution to an I agree problem, that we can now see postings only when I have posted my first posting. And we have done this with, a, um, we do an example of um, students see a magic trick and they have to explain what the trick is, how that's working. And we are looking at whether they come up with sort of cognitive information processing sort of explanations for that. And if we didn't have this, the first person who got it, everybody else would just say, I agree. And here they are forced to think about it and try to solve it. But again, the question we have to ask ourselves every time, is it novel, effective, whole? Is it a total package? And for each of the examples, I'm going to ask us this question. And maybe that's a question that we need to ask ourselves as educators, as teachers, when we are trying to use technology in a classroom. These are two critical questions. Example number two, uh, this is a short video uh, of a third grade teacher and uh, I let her speak for herself. Hello, my name is Cindy Morden and I'm a third grade teacher at Doherty Elementary School in West Bloomfield, Michigan. My classroom is made up of 24 students that are very diverse and basically children at this age are very stuck on concrete representations of of everything basically and when they're looking at a map it's really hard for them to grasp the concept of north south east west and the compass rows and really having that perspective of direction and following maps are um, sometimes difficult okay so the goal is to understand maps to go beyond concrete understandings and to make maps more personal um, this is a part of a much longer video, so I'm showing you some little clips from that. And Cindy tried a bunch of different solutions. I mean, she used MapQuest, KidPix, satellite photos as a way, as ways of getting into students' understanding, as a way of getting them to see themselves as located in the space, which is north, south, east, west, coordinates, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, tried virtual field trips. I'll let her speak about uh, one such trip that she took. I actually did this with a trip through Washington, D.C. 
and we took the video camera on the trolley ride and um, got uh, shots of all the different monuments and traveling on the trolley in the different directions. And the kids were really able to grasp um, the concept of making turns on the map and traveling north, south, east, or west and relating it to the more abstract map. It really drives home the hands-on and personal experience for the child. They really feel a part of this. They, they can make those connections that it's their world and they're working with it. And it's, it's like a discovery experience for them. It's like one of those aha moments of uh, this is where I am on the map. And that really is inspiring for the kids. Okay, so you can see in this little example, and we were kind of deliberate not to choose some very high-tech new examples because the idea of the the TPAC is that it can work even with some very basic technology. So a whiteboard is a technology in the way we think about it. So what this does, you can see, is that offer new opportunities to connect with content. And again, of course, the question that we ask ourselves, is it novel, effective, and whole? Is it the total package? The third example is not really an example, but a possibility that we'd like to um, share with you. We want to introduce you to a bunch of uh, creatures um, we had the Trinidadian guppy, and this time we are going to go with some sand creatures. And these are creatures developed by this designer called Theo Jensen. Um, I think he's in South Africa. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but it's fascinating. My name is Theo Jensen. I'm a kinetic sculptor. My sculptures are made of very light materials, and they are powered by the wind. A part of me is an engineer who wants to map the progress of mobility. Another part is an artist who wants to sculpt the air that surrounds us and give it shape. And always I strive to push the boundaries of what we know and what seems possible to us at this moment in time. The walls between art and engineering exist only in our minds. If you haven't seen examples of his work, do go online and look him up. I mean, it is absolutely mind-boggling the kinds of creatures he's created, which move just because of the breeze. And he has these things where if you move close to it, it'll move away from you. It's just fascinating. So this is something that, you know, this guy's doing. He's an artist, engineer, whatever he is. And the question is that what does that mean for a kid in a classroom? And there is a website called sodaplay.com where you can actually go and create these creatures. And I'm going to see if I can get it to show up here. There we go. There's a little soda play guy. And you can't see the full thing because the screen resolution. Let me see if I can. There we go. So you can see you can change the force of gravity. Uh, I can't see my cursor, I'm sorry. But you can change the force of gravity, you can change friction, and you can design this creature. And this is not the only creature you can design, you can design a whole bunch of different creatures that will move and interact with the environment and so on. So here's somebody who's working with actual materials. Here's a simulation. Again, coming back to the protein nature of the computer. It's a question of that it allows, that software allows you to do all kinds of different things. Um, it's interesting if you go in there and you change gravity to negative, this creature starts floating up. Um, this is kind of, kind of fun. To come back, <clears throat> one thing that Theo Janssen said, where he said that the, the walls between art and engineering exist only in our minds. And I want us to think about that a little bit with a slight change. That the walls between technology, pedagogy, and content exist only in our minds. But we have to be willing to play with the knowledge that we have. If you look at current practice,